So my name is Ashton Mara. I am the co-director of Reporting on Addiction. Um, and today's conversation is part of the work that we're doing this year to help journalists cover the billions of dollars that are coming into our communities from the settlements of the opioid litigation. Um, I know that today we probably have folks who are joining us from all walks of life, from all areas of interest, but just know that today's conversation is catered for journalists. Um, as you joined our conversation, you were notified, I'm sure, that it is being recorded, and that's because we want to share it out with you after the fact. Um, so you registered for this Zoom. I have your email addresses. I will be sharing it through to those email addresses here in the coming days. If you're someone who is not a journalist but works with journalists, we'd really love if you would share this conversation with those folks in your community to help them cover this topic. So our guest today, our speaker, is Aneri Patani. Uh, Aneri's been a journalist for more than a decade and has committed to spend the next year reporting on the opioid lawsuit settlements for um, KFF Health News, which some of us may still recognize as Kaiser as Kaiser Health News. Um, they've changed their name here recently. But her work spans um, text and digital platforms, audio platforms. She's been heard on NPR and Science Friday. Um, and her stories have received national recognition, including a 2021 award from the Institute for Nonprofit News for reporting on flawed oversight of addiction treatment facilities in Pennsylvania. And before joining KFF Health News, Aneri wrote for Spotlight PA and was a 2019 re recipient of the Rosalind Carter Fellowship for Mental Health Journalism and is also pursuing a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins University. So Aneri, thank you so much for joining us today. Today and for your time, and also for your commitment to doing this work. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to, to talk about it and hopefully share with a lot of other journalists who are working on this topic too, or soon will be. So we have a couple of set questions we're going to start with, and then I would encourage you all to please get involved. We want to spend the bulk of our time answering questions from you. You can unmute, you can raise your hand, you can drop them in the chat, whatever it is, um, and we'll also have some resources coming your way. So, Anneri, why don't we just start with kind of like a basic overview of these settlements? Like if we've not started covering them at all or not really started looking into it, um, what's the basics? Where should we start? So basic idea is, I mean, all of us are aware that there's been an opioid epidemic and addiction epidemic going on in our country for several decades now. Um, and so these are settlements related to that epidemic. They are between state governments and various companies like Johnson & Johnson, Amerisource Bergen, CVS, I'm sure many of you have heard about Purdue, which that settlement is still in the works. Um, but essentially, you know, many, like over 4,000 state and local governments sued these companies for aggressively promoting opioid painkillers, lying about how addictive they were, um, distributing them widely and negligently. And a lot of the companies, rather than go through the lawsuits, decided to settle. Um, so like I said, some of the cases are still in process, but a lot of them have, um, have been finalized or are you know, almost at those final stages. And when all is said and done, the estimated total payout is supposed to be $50 billion, a little over $50 billion actually, um, paid out to states and local governments over the course of about the next 15 plus years. Um, and the important part that I just wanna emphasize, because I know this, this can be confusing, is that the money is going to states and going to county or city governments. It's not going directly to the individuals who are harmed by the crisis, but governments are supposed to use the money for things that address the opioid epidemic. Yeah, that's a really important part of it. Um, so you've said, you've mentioned, you know, some of these settlements are already finalized. Um, how and when are states and counties and local governments receiving this money? Um, so most of them already have some of it. Uh, one of the, the biggest settlements out of all of these various companies, um, one of the biggest ones was with Johnson & Johnson and three uh, pharmaceutical distributors. And that settlement started paying out last year, so in 2022. And so far over $3 billion has gone out to state and local governments. When it comes to where exactly that money has landed, it differs from state to state because each state has a different breakdown of who controls the money. Um, so just a few examples, like I'm based in North Carolina here, um, out of our total money, like total pot that the state has won, 85%, so the biggest chunk is going directly to local governments, so county and city governments, and 15% is controlled by our legislature. But then you have you know, other places like 
Michigan, for example, has 50% controlled by local governments and 50% controlled by the state. Um, Delaware has all of its money put into this uh, abatement fund that is overseen by a council. So where that money is differs um, state to state, but uh, most of them have some amount already coming in. And some are, a lot of them are in the planning stages, but some are making um, those initial spending decisions and have already allocated, you know, we're gonna use opioid settlement funds for this initiative or that. So part of um, the difficulty we've had trying to support journalists through this coverage is exactly what you just said, because every state is different. <laughs> and then on top of it, it's county governments and they're doing things differently and local governments and they're doing things differently. Um, and I know you're gonna share some resources with us today that uh, can help some journalists figure out how the money is being allocated within their state. But before we dig into that kind of detail, are there guidelines from these settlements on how this money is to be spent? Did that come from the lawsuit process or will that come from some other place, some other way? So most of the settlements in their like legal you know, settlement agreement, which is like 500 pages, it specifies in some somewhere in there that at least 85% of the money that each state receives has to be spent on what they call opioid remediation. And essentially that means initiatives related to preventing addiction, treating addiction, um, harm reduction, or supporting recovery. And most of the settlements also have a list of suggested interventions attached to them. So it's generally called Exhibit E um, and it lists, uh, I think close to hundred or maybe over uh, different programs. So like, such as like funding treatment for people who don't have insurance to get uh, addiction treatment, building recovery homes, um, starting prevention programs in schools, uh, long, long list. But it's also a non-exhaustive list. So it's sort of there as suggestions for state and local governments, but they can choose to do things that aren't on the list too. And the big thing I like to note as a reporter is there, there is this 85% has to be spent on opioid standard in the settlement, but there's really not a lot of enforcement of it. In the settlement agreements, the only thing it says is that the companies that were sued, meaning the you know, CVSs, the Amerisource Bergens, the Johnson Johnsons, they would have to be the ones to monitor if a state is meeting that standard and, and take action if they're not. And you know, a lot of legal experts are saying that there's just, it's unlikely this, the companies are gonna do that. So reporters, the press, um, the public can sort of play a more informal role in, in monitoring where the money is going and if it's actually meeting that 85% to be spent on the opioid epidemic. Yeah, and that's part of why it's so important to do this kind of reporting for sure. Um, so money is already in most of our communities at this point, um, and local politicians, government leaders are making decisions about how to spend it. Um, even though maybe they have some recommendations from the settlements themselves, they're likely going to make those decisions. Um, when leaders, we, what we are hearing from journalists that we've talked to in, in communities across the country so far, is they've asked their local leaders how they're going to spend the money, and they're saying, well, we haven't made any decisions yet. Um, and I have been a working journalist and I've done it for 10 years. And when somebody says, I don't know, that's not really a great story. So when we're at that point in our communities, but we want to start doing this work, we want to start doing reporting about this topic. Who else can we go to? If the politician says, we don't know yet, where should we be looking for other sources for our stories? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, there are other people that I go to and, and will recommend, but I just want to say, like, I am hearing that too when I reach out to um, especially local governments, but sometimes at the state level too. And uh, I do try to push back on it a little bit. Like, I get, you know, you haven't made decisions, but what is the, what is your planning process? What have you been thinking about? This money has, they've known this money is coming for a long time. The settlements took years to come together. Um, so it's not out of the blue. Even if they haven't made final decisions, I think there's plenty of room as a reporter to, to push back and say, what is your um, process for developing spending decisions? Who are you involving in that process? Who are you talking to? What are you considering? Is there going to be public comment on your, on your spending process, et cetera, et cetera? Um, but beyond that, other people um, I often turn to are just folks who are really invested in this issue, whether that is, um, you know, uh, medical providers who are providing treatment for addiction, whether at their own clinics or, or rehabs or treatment centers or hospitals, 
uh, local syringe service programs that are often um, helping you know, meet the needs of people who are using drugs, people in recovery themselves, um, parents who have lost kids to, to overdoses. A lot of times these people know this money is coming. They may not of course be involved in how it's being spent, but they are aware of it and they have really great ideas about where it should go, right? These are the folks in the community who understand what are the needs and where did the system fall short for their son or daughter or for themselves? And so they do have ideas about how the money could be used. And so I often reach out to them to try to get a sense of what are their priorities. And then I can take that back to the officials, um, the elected officials and say, hey, you know, I know you said you haven't made any decisions yet. Here's what I'm hearing from the community. I'm wondering if this aligns with what you're thinking or how you're considering this. I'll also ask the community members, you know, have you had an opportunity to talk to the elected officials about this money and how they're using it? And um, that can sometimes lend itself to uh, stories about transparency or public involvement or lack thereof. So at this point, you are doing some coverage yourself, but um, KFF Health News and you have put together some resources to help journalists do this kind of work in their community. Um, can you share some of those resources with us? And hopefully the group will be able to use them. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to just kind of run through um, a few things that I think might be helpful. Um, so this is, uh, for KFF Health News, this is our landing page for the series. Our series is called Payback, Tracking the Opioid Settlement Cash. And here you can see, you know, some of the different stories we've done. Um, this one is about what, what I was just talking about, the lack of transparency. Um, and as part of this story, we worked with uh, Christine Minhe, who's the founder of OpioidSettlementTracker.com, to put together this map for all 50 states that shows you a few different things. So our main thing was to show, you know, how much are states and local governments um, committing to publicly report their use of this money? Um, and that's, you know, this is color coded. You can see the green ones are, are committing to more public transparency and the gray ones not so much. Um, but the other thing is if you click on a state, so again, I'm in North Carolina, um, we tried to put together a lot of information from different places so you have it in one area. So the total money that the state is expecting from the distributor and J&J &J settlements, of course, there are several other settlements. They just haven't, those amounts haven't been finalized yet. So right now we're using this amount, um, which is what is uh, the state is sure to receive. Who controls that money, which like I said, differs in every state. Which settlements the state is participating in, because again, distributors in J&J &J is one. There's also CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, Allergan, Teva. Um, this is the you know, level of transparency over here in the promised reporting section. And then if the state has a good website to you know, give you more information on this, we tried to um, include that here. So you can sort of click on your state and use that to get a lot of information in one, in one snapshot. If you scroll down a little further, um, we have this localize the data tab. And here I tried to write up basically a, a five or six point tip sheet on how you can use some of the data that we've gathered for our national investigation and localize it. Um, so I won't go, go through this in depth, but I can, um, you'll see the link in the chat if you wanna access this later. But it, it talks about how you can use our interactive map, how you can use the table that um, Christine Minhe at opioidsettlementtracker.com has put together. Um, it talks about some questions that you can ask your state or local governments to do this reporting. And then one other thing I wanted to point out, one other resource, is that um, state and local governments are supposed to report when they use this money on non-opioid purposes. So 85% has to be used on the opioid, but 15% can be used on anything. And in theory, when a state uses money for something in that 15%, they're supposed to report it to the settlement administrator. Um, there's no enforcement of this, so if they don't report something, the settlement administrator is just supposed to assume that they didn't have any non-opioid expenses. Um, so you, not every uh, state or locality will have a report here, but some of them do. So you can you know, choose either dis the distributor settlement or J&J, &J, and it'll show you which states have some reports. So Kentucky here has two reports submitted. One is from the state itself, one is from Prospect City. So you can see if your locality has submitted something. When you click on the report, it's really simple. It's just generally like a one to two pager. Um, but what it tells you is Prospect City spent 3,000, roughly $3,000 on something that does not qualify as opioid remediation. 
The report doesn't tell you what they spent it on actually, but there's someone who signs off on each report. And so I have done this where I use these reports to reach out directly to that person. I link them to this report, say, hey, I see you've spent $3,000 on something that wasn't opioid related. Can you tell me what that was? Um, and you can go from there. So that's just a helpful resource I like to point out to folks. Great, so I'm gonna start opening it up to questions from everyone. Um, you all are welcome to drop those questions into the chat or um, maybe if you wanna use the raise hand function so we have, we have some organization to uh, how the process goes, but I'll pause here for a second and see if anybody wants to jump in really quickly with questions. While we're letting some people think, Anari, you had some thoughts on some potential story ideas that folks could take away from today. Um, maybe we can start into a couple of those story ideas and let people jump in with questions. Sure. Um, so some of the things I think is just uh, a lot of people don't know, a lot of people in the general public don't know about these settlement funds. Um, but a lot of people in general public have been affected by the opioid epidemic and would care to know about them. So I think sometimes an intro story is just how much money has your locality already received? Again, most places have money in their accounts from, the, from these settlements. So you can do a quick check-in on how much money is there and what is the government planning to do about it? And again, if elected officials tell you we don't know yet, then press them on the planning process. What does it look like? You've known this money was coming for years. Like, how are you preparing for it? Um, and who is, which interests are represented in that planning process and which are not. Um, so that's just sort of one very intro story, but like it can be really helpful for, helpful for people in our audiences to understand this money. Um, and that also can spur more sources coming to you. Wonderful, yeah, that's really great. Christine, do you wanna unmute and go ahead and ask? Yeah, hi, Anari. Hey, Thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, so I started talking with uh, one of our um, health reporters in Indianapolis about how to approach this story. So we went through all the links you shared, which was uh, great, um, to get a sense of what is Indiana doing with the money. And then we kind of quickly realized that since about half of the money is given to local entities, that to do a statewide look at a story like this, it started to feel really overwhelming and kind of daunting because figure out how, like, you know, for the 50% that's going to be done or administered by the state, maybe that would be, I don't know, easier, or at least it's like one decision maker or decision making entity that we'd have to track down. But the other 50% that's being administered to like, I don't know, all the different counties and local governments, it seems like the decisions, at least in Indianapolis, like they're, you know, it's being discussed in the, the city council meetings. And then, you know, so then to track down what's happening in every single county, anyway, it just started to feel really overwhelming. So I was curious to know if you had any advice for how to do like a statewide look at this issue, or or is it just a matter of tracking down individual counties and and what, and asking each of them questions? Yeah, um, I totally feel you because I feel this on the national level where I'm like, where do I go? Everything is so different. Um, what I'd say is uh, two things come to mind. One is that I have found um, county associations super, super helpful. Um, so I don't know if Indiana has one, but like I've talked to the um, Michigan Association of Counties, the North Carolina County Association. A lot of these places are actually hiring a particular point person to work with the counties on the opioid settlement funds because they know like they had to get all the counties to agree to sign on to the, the settlement. And now they're trying to advise counties on how to spend it. So sometimes I go to the association to give me like an overview and like which counties are furthest along or which ones should I reach out to? Or can you point me to an example that's particularly interesting? Um, at a national level, the National Association of Counties, NACO is doing some of that. I think, I think the state ones are better because they can you know, drill down into your specific state and give you some specific ideas, but NACO also has a pretty good view on that and can kind of point you towards some counties. Um, and then this will not help you so much, Christine, but related to your question, um, there is a group, um, community uh, education group, which is a nonprofit that is, um, tracking these uh, county and city council meetings, because like you said, a lot of these decisions are just happening in the normal meeting process. They are doing it for the Appalachian counties, 
but they have a spreadsheet um, that I will share here in the chat um, that you can look at and it's split by state. There are different state tabs and you can look at essentially different county meetings and council meeting, meeting minutes. And they try to write in when the council is doing something about opioid settlement funds. And a re related question, if this is being decided at like council meetings, then I feel like the obvious concern is that politics is gonna influence how the money is spent. But like, what are you hearing in terms of like, is that like, is that happening? Like, I, you know, like I'm yes. thinking about like, you know, Southern Indiana has some counties where they recently voted out at the local city council level, voted out their syringe exchange programs or, you know, something along those lines. I don't remember all the details, but like there's very anti-harm reduction sentiment in certain pockets of the state. And so I'm, you know, anyways, like what are your concerns yeah. about how decisions might be made around this money and how the money might be spent that aren't, that wouldn't be, you know, uh, that aren't evidence-based you know, or, you know, would actually help yeah. address this problem. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. That is the entire story here, which like I've talked to people where it's like, yes, this money is coming for a public health crisis, but it is going through our normal political process. So how the money is spent is absolutely influenced by all of this. And there are counties where the sheriff's office is incredibly powerful. And that is where all this money will go. Um, there are counties where, you know, the syringe exchange is, is really popular, well-known, and, and there's support for harm reduction, and then it will go there. But absolutely, the politics of every locality is affecting where the money goes. I want to make some space for Samantha to get her question in, get their question. If you want to unmute. There you go. Yep, you're good. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, so I really appreciate this. I'm in, so I'm in Kansas, in Kansas City. And so it's really interesting when I saw the map because Missouri is like 100% publicly sharing information, but then Kansas is like nothing. And so I wasn't sure how to approach this from like, from my standpoint of being in covering, you know, I focus on Kansas, but what happens in Missouri obviously sometimes gets into conversations because people point to like just across the state lines, this is how it's happening. So I wasn't sure, like thoughts on like, I know a lot of states, there's several states that just don't have any public reporting on this. And so I wasn't sure how your approach to that is when we're seeing several of them just not having that. I feel like what we might think of accountability with knowing what how this money is being spent. Uh, I think the comparison you made is the great basis or like start to a to a story, right? Like we looked at transparency metrics in, in our state and, and the other, and Kansas is, is not doing it, whereas Missouri is. And why is that? And basically posing that to, to officials and saying like, hey, you can make these changes. They, they can make, it, it takes passing a law. There's a model state law that people can use that includes, you know, transparency metrics. Um, so it, it's not something they have plenty of, they have the ability to change it and there's plenty of time to change it because these settlements are being paid out over many years. Um, so I like, I know there are folks who have already thought about kind of using our map to do that sort of story. And I would love to see more, more stories like that. Um, also, if you send me an email, there is a, are you already in touch with the Sunflower Foundation in Kansas? I am not. I recently started as a reporter in Kansas, so I, I was originally in Indiana, actually, so I'm getting to know in Kansas. Um, I was going to say, if you send me an email, I will um, give you a contact or like a place you should talk to about the settlement funds in Kansas. Thank you. And I will drop my email into the chat. Uh, we've got a question in the chat from Brian while you're doing that. Uh, a reporter in southern Minnesota and has done a couple stories on opioid funding decisions so far. My experience with sources is similar to what you described, a lot of I don't knows and only broad descriptions of how funds will be used. Based on your experience in other parts of the country, can you give us your read on when it would be reasonable to hear about specific uses for the funding? This is uh, this is one of those hard ones because everywhere is so different. Their timelines and processes are different. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know how helpful this is other than to say that like I'm hearing things across the board. There are um, you know some states that have already uh, had money go through the budget process, that have the opioid settlement funds allocated in their normal budget process or in in separate processes. Uh, and I've made you know, multiple years of decisions. There are others who have just put the money into an account and said, 
we we don't even know what we're going to do with it. We're not really thinking about it right now. It doesn't expire, so we'll just kind of let it hang out there. Um, if that is the case, I think a potential story is talking to folks on the ground about what the situation is like and where there are funding needs and how pressing that need is. Because I know some communities that I talk to, they're like, we understand the desire to spend the money, you know, thoughtfully and not rushed. But at the same time, you know, people are dying while while the money's sitting in the in the account, and there are initiatives that they want funded. Um, so if if your government or elected officials really aren't giving you any sort of timeline or any insight, you can go to the community and say, "What do you think about that?" And sometimes they'll push back with like, "We need there's a sense of urgency in the community that is not being reflected in how the money's being spent." Yeah, thank you for that. And Allison asked, I'm in Virginia, and my sense is that many cities and counties don't know much about the opioid abatement authority, let alone what are best practices, practices to use the funds. How can journalists help inform recipients of the funds? Hmm. I wonder if it's just the just sort of the um, intro story that we talked about, you know, hey, this much, I mean, the headline is something like, X billion dollars have arrived in our state, how should they be spent? And then, you know, talk to, to the um, public health folks, talk to the addiction treatment experts, lay out some of those best practices. Um, like we can kind of be that conduit by doing that research and, and bringing it all together in an article um, to say, hey, this money is here. How do the experts say we should um, spend it? How do, you know, folks who have been personally affected by the opioid epidemic want to see it spent? Yeah, I think just to reiterate for your path of answers for your past two questions, I also dropped in the chat um, reporting on addiction has a database of experts who have been vetted and and had to agree to speak to journalists in order to be in our database. And so if you're in this place where people are saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, there are some folks in that database who will speak to you and you can use you can search that database by location and by um, area of expertise. I'm sorry, did someone start to ask a question that I cut off? Maybe not. We do have, I mean, we only have two minutes left, but we do have time for maybe one more if anybody has anything pressing. Um, Anari, I think there was one line in your national story where it was like concerns might be that like, oh, and counties might take this and like pour it into the um, law enforcement and like ramp up their war on drugs. Like, is is that something you've heard is actually happening or is that just like a theoretical concern? I've heard this is actually happening in a lot of places. Um, this is in, from what I'm hearing, most likely happening with the um, local governments. So when county governments control the money, uh, a lot of times it goes to to sheriffs or offices or other law enforcement initiatives. But yes, there is documented spend of this happening in multiple states. And then is there a way to tease out if money is going to law enforcement, if it's for like good purposes or bad purposes for lack of better term? Like, are they like, a, you know, I guess it's just a matter of asking, are you using this to like train your officers and administering a naloxone versus just like increasing staff and like, or, you know, officers in certain communities? Yeah. Or um, yeah, I would just ask specifically, or in some cases when I'm not getting answers, I'm filing public records requests with sheriff's offices about where, where is the money going? Um, because it can be, it can be, you know, providing medications for opioid use disorder in jails which has been shown to you know, save lives. Um, but it can also be, and I am seeing this, uh, you know, let's buy squad cars and police vests and hire another detective or um, you know, beef up security at the jail. Uh, so I think just asking specifics and if they don't give them, uh, filing the public records requests for it. I think we've hit our time. Um, we had one other question dropped in the chat from Brian, but Brian, what I'm gonna do is encourage you to reach out to one of the emails for us that I'm dropping in the chat right now. It's my email address, address uh, Jonathan Stoltman, who is my partner and colleague in reporting on addiction, and Neri is, is he, obviously, who's been with us today. So um, thank you all so much. I know this is just scratching the surface. Uh, of a very, very complicated topic. But just before I let you go, I want to remind you 
how important the work is that you are doing in your communities. Um, it's difficult and there are not a lot of thank yous and more often than not, there are a lot of people who are angry about it. And those are the people that you get to hear from. Um, but I just want to say for myself, for my partners at Reporting on Addiction, we really thank you for the work that you're doing and the hard work that you're about to embark on.